<clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I think I'll have you read one portion, and then I'll have you sit down. Turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. <clears throat> Good morning. What a joy to be here. We have a Bible lesson uh, and a message, message from the heart that is really dealing with two things. I'll tell you right up front just so you can know where we're going. Uh, one is the congregation, the congregation, just say that with me, congregation, okay, the church, the congregation, and the value of it and the place of it in my life. And then secondly, uh, the Bible, the Word, the Bible, the Word. So those two uh, words are what we're going to look at today. And we're going to talk about where we are in our lives and also in, in some contexts historically. We have an election coming up on Tuesday, um, which is important. And I, I hope that you will be active, involved, voting, praying, thinking about your uh, decision and uh, voting. Uh, we we uh, also want to be, are we spiritual this morning? Yes. Do you think so? Yes. Probably. How many think probably you are spiritual this morning, right? Some you definitely know you're not, just raise your hand. <laughs> okay, it might be, okay. So anyway, but on the day after the election, we also want to be spiritual on that day too. How about it? Whether we win or lose, whatever happens in your mind or your heart, however you understand it, uh, there's something that which is bigger and very important, congregation and the word. So it changes our lives. Uh, let's just read the, these uh, verses, chapter 12, verse 11. Read them with me. If you do not have your Bible with you, you can read them on the screen. Ecclesiastes 12, 11. One, two, three. Ready? The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. Let's stop there. Notice it. How many have read the verse before? You're familiar with it. Okay. How many of you never read this verse where you don't know what it's saying? Okay. All right. And the others, just, you know, I'm, <laughs> you're smart. Don't, don't make a move. Don't raise the hand. <laughs> you know, I'm not, hey, hey, okay. Look at it. Verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. Nails, words are nails, sayings are nails, and they are fastened by who? Master, the master of assemblies. Who is that? One shepherd. Right? One shepherd is the master of assemblies, and he's assembling something, and he's using nails. What are nails? They are words. So that, that's the breakdown of the verse. Let's read it again. Did you hear me? Okay, let's go. Verse 11, 1, 2, 3. The words of the wise are as goads. Now, that, that's a funny word, goads, isn't it? Like a peg... Uh, a a, um, a goad is actually a stick that is used in uh, farming or dealing with animals to goad them, prod them. Words of the wise are as these prodding instruments and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. Okay? Verse 12, and further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Okay, 
Father, we pray you would give us the things to say. Thank you for every heart, every person that is honoring you today by their presence and standing in the congregation. We need words. We need the nails. God, you are assembling your body, your temple, together by nails and establishing us in your faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We want to welcome uh, Pastor Moses Baldwin and his family over here to my left from Florida. <clears throat> if you look up on the screen, I have a map of Europe, and Ukraine is where we were this past week. We had a Greater Grace Conference in the country of the Ukraine. Here's the close up. We were in a city here called L Lviv. Oops. Uh oh. I wonder what happened. Okay. Here we go. We were here in the city of Lviv where the main church is the Greater Grace Church that was started by Pastor Chris Moore. Uh, in Gosha years ago in the 90s, and then uh, Pastor Jason Moore and his wife Leah were pastoring and ministering there also for, I think, four years. And they have a Bible college and have started here in uh, Odessa. Pastor Gromov lives here in the Crimea. Uh, in uh, Kiev, there's a fellowship, uh, Cherkasse. Dnieper Petrovsk area, uh, there are two churches too. And we assembled, uh, Russians came from Moscow over up in that way. A uh, Swede pastor Toll came uh, from Stockholm. Um, Hungarians, about 40 Hungarians came, Pastor Barry and Pastor Graham, Pastor Kende. Peter Mary, remember Peter Mary? Well, he married a Ukrainian fine young lady, and they were there happy, laughing, Christmas tree. Uh, scarf was not with him at this time, uh, but many of us know him and his uh, love and, and energy, and joy, encouragement, and many others. And I want to talk a little bit about this experience that I had and that's where uh, the message this morning is coming from. Um, in the world, and this was Soviet, this is the former communist world. By in, between the ye years of uh, 1990, and we were in behind the Iron Curtain in 1976 is when we started. Oops. Uh, and we, we did an underground Bible college in the Soviet Union. We uh, smuggled Bibles into the Soviet Union. Uh, we met people. We evangelized. And we were working during those years uh, from Finland initially. And then uh, as our ministry grew uh, from the states and different places, there was uh, mission work in the Soviet Union. After it ended, 1990, uh, we moved there to Hungary. Uh, there was already, in 1986, a fellowship in Poland. Uh, but in, in make, it, make, it short, make it short, in, tw in 10 years' time, we uh, started 24 churches in 24 uh, Soviet, just stubbornly, Soviet cities or former communist cities all the way out to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and many amazing miracles and stories of salvations. One I want to share with you briefly. A Lithuanian what young man was involved with the mafia 
got in a lot of trouble, high-level mafia activity, uh, was eventually kidnapped by them in Kazakhstan, was in a cargo container, a metal box, you know, what they are that go on tops of ships for transport. He was in chains, virtually desperate for survival. He was in a lot of trouble. Uh, kidnapped, chained, held in solitary, escaped, went to the main city in uh, Kazakhstan, and went to the police, and they were not going to help him. Uh, you know, you, you know we, they, they had nothing to do with him. And somebody at the office said, a woman at the office said, the police station said, you need Jesus in your life. Jesus will help you. That statement went like a nail in his heart. Like he didn't know about this. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know what this woman was saying. And there was some type of a preacher there in Kazakhstan. And somehow this woman had, was a believer. And this man started to pray to Jesus. And supernaturally, he got the documents. He got the permission. And he flew out of the country and was amazed that Jesus did this for him. He became a very fervent believer, left uh, Russia, uh, left Lithuania, is one of our disciples in a European country. Uh, maybe someday you'll meet him and you can hear his story. And he listens on the internet to these messages and is loving the finished work message. These kind of stories have happened all over the Soviet Union. And the Ukraine is a good example. Because the master of assemblies, that is God, who, who it actually says masters of assemblies, it's like underlings who are used in the assembling, uh, are given words or nails by one shepherd. Well, we know who the one shepherd is. That's Christ. And he's given words, and they are like nails, and they are putting together the body of Christ, assembling us in a sure place in the congregation. I'd like you to turn to Jeremiah 10 and read another kind of nail. In Jeremiah 10, verse 4, speaking about idols that are decked with silver and with gold. If you follow it with me, don't let your mind wander. This will not be a long message, but we'll get to some very important points. They deck it with silver and gold and fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. We just had a hurricane, or whatever they want to call it, powerful storm. A lot of things moved by that hurricane. If you have an idol and you don't want it to be stolen, it's decked with silver and gold, it might be that a thief will come and steal it. If you have an idol, that which is made by man, you might have to fasten it with nails or it might fall over. Remember the story in 1 Samuel 5? They brought the ark into the temple of Dagon. Dagon was half fish and half man. We have the idea with a mermaid, half woman, half fish. Well, the god, day god, was an idol that was fallen over when it, the ark of God was put into the temple of Dagon and the ark fell over. How many know the story? You know the story? Let's just take a quick look at it. 1 Samuel 5 for the emphasis. And we'll, it only takes a couple verses. Verse 1. 
the Philistines took the ark of God, 1 Samuel 5, 1. They took the ark of God. Do you know what the ark of God was? The ark of God was a box about so long, about so wide, about this high, and it was a holy, it was a holy uh, piece of furniture that was put into the Jewish temple, into the Holy of Holies. On the top was the mercy seat. Inside were three articles. They sprinkled blood on the top, and the priest could go in and come out once a year as he offered the blood. It represented God. Well, the Philistines captured it. Like, isn't it Raiders of the Lost Ark is the name of a movie? Maybe some of you backslidden people have seen the movie. Joking. Okay, so anyway, listen, I'm joking. Okay, listen. The, the lost ark, the idea that the ark is still existing somewhere and it's lost and try to find it. Well, here it says, the Philistines took the ark and they brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. Verse 2. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon, set him up in his place again. Now, this is in principle what it means. There's a lie, and then there's God. When God and the lie meet, the lie essentially is discovered to be a lie. It falls over, so to speak. The lie cannot stand in the presence of God. The lie doesn't have power in itself. So they set it back up again. Then, verse 4, when they arose early on the morning, morrow, morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were caught off upon the threshold. No feet were caught off because he didn't have feet. He had a fish tail. His palms were cut off and his head was cut off, and he was down. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 5, they fasten the idols with nails. That, in effect, is the whole idea in our culture, in our society, where we have things that we believe and embrace, and we're afraid they're going to be moved, stolen, fallen over, found out to be less than what they really pretend to be, or appear to be. God comes in and says, hey, I am God. Case closed. Everything is subject to me, and you don't have to fasten me with any nails. I will fasten you with nails. You don't fasten me. I am God. And everything is revolving around me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you get connected with me, then you won't be moved either. You'll not be ashamed, you'll not be afraid, you'll not be found out to be a liar, you'll not be embracing a lie, but you get connected with me, you get nailed, you get fastened by the masters of assemblies, which maybe we could say are those that are ministering the word of God, the masters of assemblies, the apostles, the prophets, they are not for today, we are only, we are pastors, and we are teachers of the word, but we could say the masters of assemblies, those that are knowing the finished work doctrine, the message of Christ, the message of grace, are bringing nails that are fastening us to that which can never be moved. Turn now to the book of Ezra and read another interesting verse this morning. If you can find it, a lot of you are Bible students and learning the Bible and Finding Ezra in the Bible. I'll give you a hint. It's in the Old Testament. Ezra chapter 9, verse 8. Now for a little space, grace has been showed 
from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. God gives us a nail in a holy place. What does that mean? Well, in the historical context, the Jews had been driven out of their country, brought back to ba or brought to Babylon, and now they are going back to Israel, and they have a they call Israel the city of Jerusalem, the country of Israel, a nail in a sure place. God has given us a little grace and given us a place where we could be fastened. We need to be fastened. And that's why Christ came into the world. We would be born again and start to hear in a new way. In the Ukraine, wow, it was a blessing because we met in the mornings and in the afternoons and in the evenings. And these Ukrainian and Russian believers are looking at us like, and we're looking at them amazed amongst ourselves that we don't need any kind of activity to reinforce a lie. We are not pretending. We're not trying to reinforce a program or a system of any kind. But we are enjoying the fact that they and us are nailed to a sure place. We are fastened with truth in our hearts to our Heavenly Father, that God is our God. This testimony is evident in so many places in the world. Hallelujah. God is teaching us about the congregation. The congregation is not a denomination. It may be. It's not an organization. It may be. It is, of course, in a way. But it's a lot more than that. It is God, the Holy Spirit, bringing nails and driving into our hearts, connecting us to himself and establishing us in the very mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16. We have same values as he, same mind, same way of thinking, though we are weak and maybe sometimes very troubled. But this is how God has fit us together. I read this piece. As members of the body of Christ, we can be compared to pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece has protrusions and indentations. The protrusions represent our strengths, gifts, talents, abilities. The indentations represent our weaknesses, faults, limitations, shortcomings, undeveloped areas. The beautiful thing is that the pieces complement one another and produce a beautiful whole. Just as each piece of a puzzle is important, so each member of the body of Christ is important and can minister to the other members of the body. I think of us, how God put us together, and I have my weaknesses and you have yours, and that's fine because it's God's way to use us, even though we fail and we stumble. But we are not insecure about our failure because we are learning that God is the one that takes care of us in our failure, that God is the one that gives us grace. And God is the one that teaches us his mind and his purpose. There's a story about a man who was walking by a used bookstore, and he saw through the window the title of the book, How to Hug. And he kind of was interested in, like, what would they say about that, How to Hug? It's such a thick book. So he went into the bookstore, and he bought it. And then when he opened it up and he started to look at it, he realized that it's the seventh volume of an encyclopedia, 
And the first word in the encyclopedia is how, and the last word in that volume is hug. <laughs> that he wanted to know how about how to hug, and he finds only an encyclopedia on the word how and the word hug and all the technical information in between. And that could be called, that could be something like what happens in a church. That I want to I want to be connected, but when I get there, I don't find the connection. I want to know about a hug in a godly way, or we could say a connection, a contact. I want to be loved, I want to be cared for, I have a need. When I go there, I find more of an encyclopedia than an organic body of Christ. But the nails, the words that God gave the Ukrainian people by these pastors and workers, and the work goes on. And throughout all those 24 different cities, the multiplication, the, every one of them more or less is doing some more evangelism and some more ministry with nails from the one shepherd. And we are being built up in a congregation, the congregation that knows how to hug. In the New Testament, we greet one another with a holy kiss. I got to tell you a funny story. Years ago in the 70s, I was in Russia, in Moscow, standing on the steps of a Russian Orthodox church. Early one morning, we were to rendezvous with some believers there. I didn't know who they were. I was by myself early morning, standing there in the cold Russian winter day on a Sunday morning. And a man walks across the square, comes up to me, he's got a big beard, fur, fur hat, fur coat, everything. And he walks right up to me, comes up closer, close quickly, and he kisses me on the lips. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in shock. <laughs> it was his Orthodox, Russian Orthodox greeting. In the New Testament, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. That all sounds weird right now. <laughs> but there's some spiritual meaning in it. How to hug. We don't need a book on it. We have learned by the masters of assemblies from one shepherd that nails have gone into our hearts in a sure place. And with our election right around the corner, there's going to be a lot of emotion on the next day. And we hope everything will go peacefully and soundly and fairly. And it's important for us to recognize that regardless of the outcome, we are fastened by our maker, by our God, in a sure place where you'll never be ashamed You'll always be encouraged, you'll always be loved, you'll always be edified, and you'll always be enlightened. Contrarily, it's kind of like, um, let's see, I've got to try to find. Contrarily, when, when the idol is tipped over, the people are very upset about it, turn it upside down, fasten it with, or right side up, fasten it with nails and protect it and say, you cannot touch that. That's like the way it is. That's the truth. This is how it is. Wow. Can you imagine having a religion? You're afraid it's going to fall over? Can you imagine having a philosophy, a theory? I love to see the scientists who are supposed to be very objective and very scientific, and many, many of them are. But unfortunately, some of them are very much shaken by even questioning the age of the Earth, the age of the universe, the dating of fossils, the strata, 
The, uh, the fossils, they find the theory of evolution, DNA, it's amazing. Where did all the DNA come from? It's like saying, I have an electrical wire here, and, you know, where's electricity come from? From the electrical wire. It doesn't come from the electrical wire. Where does it come from? It comes through the wire, but where is the electricity coming from? And the same with the human race. Where did we come from? We came from our mother and father. Duh! And, and so on. I'm saying there's a lot of insecurity in the world with a lot of nailing that's going on, lest that which they are believing would be disproved. And in that insecurity, there is a lot of emotion and a lot of trouble. In God's congregation, we are defending nothing but enjoying the fact that we are fastened to his person and we are loving him. Of course, we are defending our faith. Of course, we are defending a position, but not in the sense of insecurity, but out of love. God loves. God knows how to hug. God knows how to speak. God knows how to edify. God knows how to establish us in this new way. Lastly, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. He's speaking about being a soldier, verse 3. Verse 4, entanglement. That word is ampleco in the Greek, and it's the same word used when the soldiers made the crown of thorns in Matthew uh, is it 26. When the soldiers made the crown of thorns, they wove, the, they wove it. They wove the thorn branches. They wove them. That's ampleco. They, they wove the crown. And there, this one other place the word is used for us not being entangled in the affairs of this life or woven into the affairs of this life, which raises a lot of questions. I'm a citizen. I pay taxes. I have financial commitments. I, ha I have a bank uh, that I deal with. Uh, we have relationships, jobs. We have insurances. Uh, we are woven into, it seems, that we are woven into the affairs of this world. And yet, at the same time, there's something that is beautiful in our lives that speaks of detachment. I am here, but in a way, there's a detachment because of the nails, the mind and the heart, the connection with a God that is in the world, but not of it. With God who made the world and came here, but said, I am light and the world is darkness. What is this darkness? It's this thing here in principle. The darkness of, you know, no, we, you know, it's us, <clears throat> you know, in a very short word, um, I looked on YouTube for these chips, microchips. I don't remember how I got there, but I saw a video of a club in Amsterdam, Holland, where if you are a VIP member, you enter the club by a chip that is in your arm. And then you go to the bar, and this was on video. The man goes to the bar, and they just scan his elbow, 
and he buys the drink. There's no cash, there's no cards, no membership. There's only a chip implanted in his elbow. All of this technology fascinates us and asks the question, where is our society going? And the Bible answers, totalitarianism. George Orwell, 1984, Animal Farm. Big Brother is watching. I'm getting speeding tickets on a regular basis. <laughs> because of cameras, license plate number, everything. Your medical material, everything about you, what you buy and sell, all of it is known by the system today. And we need to just simply recognize it and say, fine. That's the way it is. Where is it ultimately going? A man will be a leader over the whole world. Revelation 12, verse 9. The whole world will be deceived. It'll be this. It'll be a, 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 the whole program. And if it's teetering, they will nail it down and lie more. They will control and they will organize, and they will succeed in part. But we are different. We say, fine, that is okay, that's the way it goes, the Bible tells us so. And uh, many details can be shared about it, but that's okay. We are fascinated. We are like the jigsaw puzzle pieces, deficiencies, and pluses. We are fitly framed together, Ephesians chapter 4. We are learning. We are anticipating the coming of Christ. We're anticipating when the church goes, this thing is going to come alive like crazy. This whole organized program without Christ, without God, is going to come alive. We are not entangled with it. We have something about us, uh, something beautiful about us where we say, uh, I'm happy about who I am. I'm happy about how I see life. I'm happy about my brothers and sisters. I'm happy about what God is saying to my heart. I'm happy about what love is. I'm happy about Christ coming and being so kind. I love the kindness of Christ. I love his meekness and his humility. And you know, when he was standing next to this, this were the, the Pharisees in Israel. And when their word was shaken by him, they nailed it down and then they nailed him to the cross. And said, we cannot live with you around here. You are gone. You are history. They crucified him. But three days later, and here we are. We are those that are not of that. We are not entangled, woven in with, and part of it in that sense. We, we see it for what it is, and we are not upset by it. We are saying we are on a mission Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Kazakh, Russians, Hungarians, Poles, Romanians, Turks, Arabs. We met Arabs who came up to our conference from Kiev, medical students, and they are born again, and they started a church in Kiev. And we had a good talk, and they, went, they, they just want to go in the right direction, and they are learning. It was a great day. Lastly, Psalm 119. Maybe I should finish there. Um, wondering if I should. Yeah, let's close with a, a joke <laughs> before we take our communion. There's a Russian parable, and it goes like this, and it's about compromise. Like, don't compromise. 
When you are entangled with the world, we compromise. We're not going to compromise. We can't compromise. And the Russian parable goes like this. A Russian hunter found it was hunting bear, and he raised his rifle and put his sight on the bear, and then the bear started to talk. The bear said in a very soft voice, we can negotiate. And the hunter put his rifle down and he said, what? He said, Bear said, we can talk about it. We can negotiate. What is it that you want? The man said, I want a, a bear skin coat. And, the, and, and he said, what do you want? And the bear said, well, I want a full stomach. And the bear said, I, I know I can accommodate you. Let's sit down and talk. They sat down and they talked for a while, and within a short time, only the bear was left. The bear walked away with a full stomach, and the man had a bear skin coat. You know, who are you sitting down? Did you get it? The man ended up in the bear's stomach. He got the coat, and the bear got the meal. And who won? Okay. Be careful what you are fastened to and what you are doing. We are not, re we are not embracing any lie. You know, we are, I'm not interested in lies. I'm not interested in compromises. We are loving and understanding, and we learn how to hug. We learn how to care. We learn how to have a mission. We learn how to bring a message. We learn how to live a life. We learn how to forgive in the congregation. Because in the congregation are the words, the nails that are needed so that I am fastened to a sure place and not be ashamed. One day death will knock on your door. There's another story. Should I finish with that one? Okay. No, I won't. <clears throat> really? $5, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, when a, man, a man was walking in a city, and, and suddenly on the street, death came to him. Death being a person. Death personified came to him, and death looked shocked. Shocked. And the man was afraid, and the man ran away. He went to a friend's house. He said, I saw death on the street. I'm afraid. I think he's coming for me. And the man said, No, this is what you do. You go to the other, another city. And go to the other city tomorrow, right away. Go to another city. And so the man said, Yeah, that's a good idea. So he went to the other city. And there, walking down the street, he saw death. And the man said, did you come to take me? He said, yes. He said, I saw you yesterday and you looked surprised. Why did you look surprised? He said, I looked surprised because you were in the wrong city. <laughs> because I had an appointment with you today here. You know what that means? That, that knock on your door, you cannot escape it, but you don't have to worry about it because you're nailed to the place where there's eternal life, where you'll never die. You're nailed by Christ at the cross. You died already. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Oh, God, you have done such great things for us. And the world is lying continually and reinforcing it ceaselessly with a lot of energy and it's going somewhere politically, economically, and ideologically, and we're not part of it. We're woven into another fabric. Christ's garment was one thread all the way through, like the sweater where you pull, up, pull the yarn when it's all woven one and you pull it and it's all one. Christ's coat at the cross was without a seam, 
No seam, no pieces. It was one because that's like us, his body. We are one without seam because we're all nailed to the same person with the same spirit for the same purpose and the same destiny and we'll never be ashamed. Amen. Would you pray with me? We would like you today to come to Christ personally. We'd like you in your heart to say to Christ, I believe in you. We'd like you to say by faith, Jesus Christ, you're the only answer for me in this crazy world. Hurricane San Sandy came through and moved things. Death knocks on the door and people that without Christ are, are moved and lost. But Jesus comes today and says to you, come to me. I am the one that loves you. I am the one that saves you. I am the one that cares for you. Come today. Raise your hand, please, for the ushers to give you a booklet. If you're asking Christ into your life this morning, please just raise your hand. Thank you. Right down here. Anyone else? Anyone in the back, anywhere? We have communion this morning, and anyone who is a believer in Christ, you're welcome to partake of it. Amen.